Chapter 4 A Secret No Longer For several weeks it seemed the prayers and good luck symbols had done their work well. Sadako felt strong and healthy as she ran, ran longer and faster, but that all ended one crisp, cold winter day in February. Sadako was running to the schoolyard. Suddenly, everything seemed to whirl around her, and she sank to the ground. One of the teachers rushed over to help. I, I guess I'm just tired, Sadako said in a weak voice. When she tried to stand up, her legs went wobbly, and she fell down again. The teacher sent Mitsu home to tell Mr. Sasaki. He left his barber shop and took Sadako to the Red Cross Hospital. As they entered the building, Sadako felt a pang of fear. Part of this hospital was especially for those with the atom bomb sickness. In a few minutes, Sadako was in the examining room where a nurse x-rayed her chest and took some of her blood. Dr. Numata tapped her back and asked a lot of questions. Three other doctors came in to look at Sadako. One of them shook his head and gently stroked her hair. By now, the rest of Sadako's family was at the hospital. Her parents were in the doctor's office. Sadako could hear the murmur of their voices. Once her mother cried, Leukemia! But that's impossible! At the sound of that frightening word, Sadako put her hands over her ears. She didn't want to hear any more. Of course she didn't have leukemia. Why, the atom bomb hadn't even scratched her. Nurse Yasunanga took Sadako to one of the hospital rooms and gave her a kind of cotton kimono to wear. Sadako had just climbed into bed when her family came in. Mrs. Sasaki put her arms Sadako, around Sadako. You must stay here for a little while, she said, trying to sound cheerful, but I'll come every evening. And we'll visit you after school, Mashiro promised. Mitsu and Iji nodded, their eyes wide and scared. Do you really have, do I really have the atom bomb disease? Sadako asked her father. There was a troubled look in Mr. Sasaki's eyes, but he only said, the doctors want to make some tests, that is all. He paused, then added, they might keep you here for a few weeks. A few weeks! To Sadako, it sounded like years. She would miss graduation into junior high school, and even worse, she would not be part of the racing team. Sadako swallowed hard and tried not to cry. Mrs. Sasaki fussed over Sadako. She plumped her pillows and smoothed the bedspread. Mr. Sasaki cleared his throat. Is, is there anything you want, he asked. Sadako shook her head. All she really wanted was to go home. But when? A cold lump of fear grew in her stomach. She had heard that many of the people who went into this hospital never came out. Later, nurse, nurse Yasunaga set the others away so that Sadako could rest. When she was alone, Sadako buried her face in a pillow and cried for a long time. She had never before felt so lonely and miserable. Chapter 5 The Golden Crane The next morning, Sadako woke up slowly. She listened for her family sounds, familiar sounds of her mother making breakfast, but there was only the new and different sounds of a hospital. Sadako sighed. She had hoped that yesterday was just a bad dream. It was even more real when nurse Yasunaga came in to give her a shot. Getting shots is part of being in the hospital, the plump nurse said briskly. You'll get used to it. I just want the sickness to be over with, Sadako said unhappily, so I can go home. That afternoon, Shizuko was the first visitor. She smiled mysteriously as she held something behind her back. Shut your eyes, she said. While Sadako squinted her eyes tightly, Shizuko put some pieces of paper and scissors on the bed. Now you can look, she said. What is it? Sadako asked, staring at the paper. Shizuko was pleased with herself. I figured out a way for you to get well, she said proudly. Watch. She cut a piece of gold paper into a large square. In a short time, she had folded it over and over into a beautiful crane. Sadako was puzzled. How can that bird, how can that paper bird make me well? Don't you remember the old story about the crane? Shizuko asked. It's supposed to live for a thousand years. If a sick person folds one, 1,000 paper cranes, the gods will grant her wish and make her healthy again. She handed the crane to Sadako. Here's your first one. Sadako's eyes filled with tears. How kind of Shizuko to bring a good luck charm, especially when her friend didn't really believe in such things. Sadako took the golden crane and made a wish. The funniest little feeling came over her when she touched the bird. It must be a good omen. Thank you, Shizuko-shan, she whispered. I'll never part with it. When she began to work with the paper, Sadako discovered that folding a crane wasn't as easy as it looked. With Shizuko's help, she learned how to do the difficult parts. After making ten birds, Sadako lined them up on the table beside the golden crane. Some were a bit lopsided, 
but it was a beginning. Now I only have 999 to make, Sadako said. With the golden crane nearby, she felt safe and lucky. Why, in a few weeks, she would be able to finish the thousand. Then she would be strong enough to go home. That evening, Mashiro brought Sadako's homework from school. When he saw the cranes, he said, There is enough room on that small table to show off your birds. I'll hang them from the ceiling for you. Sadako was smiling all over. Do you promise to hang every crane I make? she asked. Mashiro promised. Masashiro promised. That's fine, Sadako said, her eyes twinkling with mischief. Then you'll hang the whole thousand. A thousand, her brother groaned? You're joking. Sadako told him the story of the cranes, and Masashiro ran a hand through his straight black hair. You tricked me, he said with a grin, but I'll do it anyhow. He borrowed some thread and tacks from Nurse Yasunanga and hung the first ten cranes. The golden crane stayed in its place of honor on the table. After supper, Mr. Mrs. Sazaki brought Mitsu and Iji to the hospital. Everyone was surprised to see the birds. They reminded Mrs. Sasaki of a famous old poem. Out of colored paper, cranes come flying into our house. Mitsu and Iji liked the golden crane best, but Mrs. Sasaki chose the tiniest one made of fancy green paper with pink parasols on it. This is my choice, she said, because small ones are the most difficult to make. After visiting hours, it was lonely in the hospital room. So lonely that Sadako folded more cranes to keep up her courage. Eleven, I wish I get better. Twelve, I wish I get better. Chapter six, Kenji. Everyone saved paper for Sadako's good luck cranes. Shizuko brought colored paper from the bamboo class. Father saved every scrap from the barber shop. Even nurse Yasunaga gave Sadako the wrappings from packages of medicine. And Masashiro hung every one of the birds as he had promised. Sometimes he strung many on one thread. The biggest cranes flew alone. During the next few months, there were times when Sadako felt almost well. However, Dr. Uh, Dr. Numata said it was best for her to stay in the hospital. By now, Sadako realized that she had leukemia, but she, she also knew that some patients recovered from the disease. She never stopped hoping that she would get well, too. On good days, Sadako was busy. She did her homework, wrote letters to her friends and pen pals, and amused her visitors with games, riddles, and songs. In the evening, she always made paper cranes. Her flock flew over one, over 300. Her flock grew to over 300. Now the birds were perfectly folded. Her fingers were sure and were quickly without any mistakes. Gradually, the atom bomb disease took away Sadako's energy. She learned about pain. Sometimes the throbbing headache stopped her from reading and writing. At other times, her bones seemed to be on fire, and more dizzy spells sent Sadako into deep blackness. Often, she was too weak to do anything but sit by the window and look longingly out at the maple tree in the courtyard. She would stay there for hours, holding the, crane in her, holding the golden crane in her lap. Sadako was feeling especially tired one day when new, Nurse Yasunaga wheeled her out into the porch for some sunshine. There, Sadako saw Kenji for the first time. He was nine and small for his age. Sadako stared at his thin face, thin and shining dark eyes. Hello, she said. I am Sadako. Kenji answered in a low, soft voice. Soon the two were talking like old friends. Kenji had been in the hospital for a long time, but he had few visitors. His parents were dead, and he had been living with an aunt in a nearby town. She's so old she comes only to see me once a week, Kenji said. I read most of the time. Sadako turned away at the sad look on Kenjo, Kenji, Kenji's face. It doesn't really matter, he went on with a weary sigh, because I will die soon. I have leukemia from the bomb. But you can't have leukemia, Sadako said quickly. You weren't even born then. That isn't important, Kenji said. The poison was in my mother's body, and I got it from her. Sadako wanted so much to comfort him, but she didn't know what to say. Then she remembered the cranes. You can make paper cranes like I do, she said, so that a miracle can happen. I know about the cranes, Kenji replied quietly, but it's too late. Even the gods can't help me now. Just then, Nurse Yasunaga came out onto the porch. Kenji, she said sternly, how do you know such things? He gave her a sharp look. I just know, he said, and besides, I can read my blood count on the charts. Every day it gets worse. The nurse was flustered. What a talker, she said. You are tiring yourself, and she wheeled Kenji inside. Back into her room. Back into her room, Sadako was thoughtful. 
She tried to imagine what it would be like to be ill and have no family. Kenji was brave. That's all. She made a big crane out of the prettiest paper and sent it across the hall to his room. Perhaps it would bring him some good luck. Then she folded more birds for her flock. 398, 399. One day, Kenji didn't appear on the porch. Late that night, Sadako heard the rumble of a bed being rolled down the hall. Nurse Yasunaga came in to tell her that Kenji had died. Sadako turned to the wall and let the tears come. After a while, she felt the nurse's gentle hand on her shoulder. Let's sit by the window and talk, Nurse Yasunaga said in a kindly voice. When Sadako finally stopped sobbing, she looked out into the mo- at the moonlit sky. Do you think Kenji is up there on a star island? Wherever he is, I'm sure he is happy now, the nurse said. He has shed that tired, sick body, and his spirit is free. Sadako was quiet, listening to the leaves on the maple tree rustle in the wind. Then she said, I am going to die next, aren't I? Of course not, your nurse Yasunaga answered with a firm shake of her head. She spread some colored paper on Sadako's bed. Come, let me see you fold another paper crane before you go to sleep. After you finish 1,000 birds, you'll live to be an old, old lady. Sadako tried hard to believe that, and she carefully folded cranes and made the same wish. 463, 464.